Good morning, and welcome to the Two Rivers Reading Series author event, sponsored by the English Division and the Two Rivers Reading Series Committee, whose members include Paige Reel, Michelle Heron, Scott Stanky, Tracy Youngblom-Turner, and myself, Kathy White. We have some housekeeping information to get out here first. I would like everyone to please turn off their cell phones if they are on. And um, I want to tell you about directly following the second reading this afternoon, which will be at 1 o'clock, the English Division is offering a creative writing information session for you all, if you can make it. It's from 1 to 1.30 in here. I believe it's going to be over in that corner, and there will be treats. Um, there will be copies of the Rapids Review and information about the AA, AFA degrees and things like that. So please consider that too. I'd like to thank the Two Rivers Reading Series Committee for putting on this offer event. We are very pleased to welcome today Catherine Kaiser, author and English faculty member here at Anoka Ramsey to campus. Kate will be reading and discussing her book of poems, Pretend the World. Pretend the World, a very beautiful book, is filled with both the personal and the political in poems that explore sub subjects as far ranging as nature, cultural identity, sexuality, and motherhood. Poet Dorian Locks notes that the poems in her book radiate a lyric vitality. And the Poetry Foundation declares the poems offer a gripping but blunt way of seeing the lives we create, the wars we wage, the things we consume, and the connections we make without overbearing sentimentality. Catherine Kaiser has published an earlier collection of poetry, Dark Lake, and edited a collection of essays, Riding Shotgun, Women Write About Their Mothers. Please look for those at the bookstore, too. Her writing has received numerous awards, including fellowships from the Minnesota State Arts Board, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Anderson Center for Interdisciplinary Studies. Thank you so much for coming this morning. And now, please welcome Ms. Kate Kaiser. About 15 years ago, um, some of the faculty in the English department started inviting visiting authors to come and talk to our classes. Scott Stanky, um, Patty Wheeler Andrews, some other folks. Um, and we started finding out that students did better when they read the books before the authors came. Um, and this sort of evolved in, into the Two Rivers Reading Series, which has been going on now for about 15 years. Um, and I'm really, really honored to be here. So thank you to Paige Reel and the entire committee for inviting me. I'm going to start by reading some poems so you can kind of hear my voice uh, reading some of the work. How many of you have read the book? Raise your hand if you've read the book. Oh, that's fabulous. So I'm going to read some poems, um, especially some that the creative writing class said that they liked yesterday. Um, and then I've got quite written questions from you, and we'll also take some questions from the audience. Um, and this should be an interactive experiment here. So. Uh, if I forget to call out the page numbers, how many of you have your books? If you want to read along, you can. Um, I will stumble and change some of the things in the book. Um, it's just like a jazz performance. Every performance of every song will be a little bit different. So if I don't say it exactly the way it is in the book, that's OK. Um, and if you don't want to read along, you can just close your eyes and listen. I'm going to start with German on page 14. During the First World War, my great-grandparents burned all the German books except the Bible, which they hid wrapped in canvas in the root cellar. They would not speak German, even in hushed tones at home. Grandma strove to enunciate each word clearly, to memorize English poems she could tick from her tongue like cards from a dealer's hand. 
They stopped making strudel, lebkuchen, spetzla, and springala, and instead cooked green beans until blanched pale, casseroles with pronounceable names ending in hot dish to be served in the Methodist church basement. During the Second World War, there were no concentration camps in Idaho, though Godhelf Wilhelm, or GW as he was known, feared when from his dusty tenement farm, he saw the Japanese and sometimes the Chinese by mistake rounded up. Saved by the color of his skin, if he kept his mouth shut, his head down, the irrigation water turned high every Thursday, church on Sunday, the store on Saturday morning, they could pretend to be safe. But at home, he hid coins in jars beneath the floorboards, on the attic rafters, behind the canned tomatoes in the cupboard. He was ready for another depression, another draft, a war. He was always waiting, always alert, ready, knowing he was the little guy, knowing the bankers owned his land, knowing his tongue revealed his origins, knowing politics could change and they would once again be, he would once again be the one they had to blame to make rest of the country feel safe. Micah. You're still hearing me okay? Yeah. All right, we're going to do red light next. Uh, drag it to red light. The day 10 people died at red light, page 33. And uh, there's a quote before the poem that comes from Don Shelby, who I recently <coughs> met recently. He's a really nice guy. Um, but this particular day, he was up at the airport at Bemidji, sticking a microphone in everybody's face, um, asking them if they were relatives. We drove the narrow road north to the border, flashes of blue sky, brown mud flats packed hard with rocks, plowed by waves with perfect precision. With perfect precision, he aimed at faces, heads, sounds popping like a paint gun, the numbers of dead counting upward like a video game score. Against the door leaned a teacher and student, others huddled in closets, bullets spraying. Before the bodies on stretchers, before the terrified parents lined the fence, before his name hummed in wires and airways, he closed his mouth on the gun and joined the white-capped waves, the muddied weeds in the ditches, the dark green shade of the pines. The day 10 people died at Red Lake, we drove a winding road north. With perfect precision, lights flashed between silhouettes of trees. Ghosts singing on those stark high wires, we will not say your names. I'm reading some of the shocking ones first, the more we'll read some of the sweet ones at the end here. Next one is Playing with Planes on page 20. I did not see the woman fall in a final graceful dance, her arms by her side, her legs bent. I did not see the pair of businessmen sweep the air holding hands past towers of glass, flames, thin ash. I did not see the sobbing soot covered people, the bridges covered with horrified onlookers, the silent swarms walking north. My son played pilot his large, loud machines miraculously zooming through sparkling skies as I changed his sister's diaper. Like children everywhere, he believes firefighters will save him. Police officers know the way to safety. Stairways are never blocked with impassable debris. Elevators glide up and down on cushions of air. Tall buildings stand forever, and no one he loves will ever die. And one poem I was surprised to hear yesterday was a favorite with the diary of a first grader. It's a rather silly poem. Um, one of the things I've been asked is what triggers my poems, what inspires me. Um, and I wrote this poem because my son would always complain that I was still wearing my pajamas when I drove him to school. I'll sometimes like, sleep in sweatpants so I can pop out the door to the bus stop or hop out the door to drive the kids. So it's like, Mom, you're still wearing your pajamas. So that was the trigger of the poem. Diary of a First Grader. My mother drives me to school in her pajamas, makes me double check my lime green backpack, lunch bag, racing car folder, homework on telling time, orange hat and mittens, green baby blanket hidden in the front pocket. 
I like to be on time to please my teacher, make my friends laugh. When Mr. Scott's voice bellows on the intercom, I am rigid with attention. I know how to sneak in line for a check second chocolate pudding, grow a mealworm in oatmeal flour and cornflakes. I know reindeer eat brownish green moss and llamas live in Peru. My teacher likes me us quiet doing worksheets, but I am looking out the window thinking of volcanoes and starships zooming through space, explosions and eruptions bigger than Earth to infinity. I can tell half past two on the grade school clock in this room with wide windows and white shades pulled down with a stick. When my mother picks me up, she is changed out of her pajamas. I run into her arms, eager to tell her about my day. I'll read one more very little poem called Holding Her. You guys may know what the pages are better than I do. It's on page 22. Holding Her. In the twilight of the evening, as the last beads of light slip through the green velvet curtains that hang like moss, her 10-year-old body curls itself around my middle, her face buried in my breast, her silken skin freshly bathed, her limbs curved and heavy with sleep. The world holds still, the earth stops on its axis and hangs, complete in its pause, the sky and moon silenced by the breath of a sleeping babe. So that's a short sampling to give you um, some flavor of kind of the range um, in the book. Um, and I'll start with some of your questions. So one of the ones a lot of people asked is where do I get my inspiration? Um, and I'm not so much necessarily inspired as pondering and confused. Um, life sometimes confuses me and I use writing as a way to make sense of it, uh, to think about uh, my ideas, to think about perspectives. So for instance, in that um, poem about my son, that's called a persona poem, where the, um, the poet speaks through a mask, a persona. Um, and so I was kind of imagining, well, what's my son's day like? You know, I drop him off, from his point of view, I drop him off, I'm, I'm in my pajamas, I drive back up, I've changed out of my pajamas, all this other stuff has happened to him. Um, so it's kind of my imagining, uh, flipping that perspective around, what is his, his uh, experience like? Um, so I write not so much because I'm inspired, but because um, I like to figure things out sometimes on paper. Many people asked, how did I get my book published? Um, I've kind of got, like, gotten married to the first guy that asked me on a date with all three of my books. Um, my first publisher, Loon Feather Press, for my book, Dark Lake, uh, they asked me if I would publish with them, and I said, sure. Um, and then my anthology, uh, women, um, uh, writing shotgun women write about their mothers, um, I sent a proposal to Minnesota Historical Society Press, and they said, we'll take it, and I said, okay. <coughs> um, and then again, uh, with Pretend the World, Jim Perlin, who's the publisher at Holy Cow <coughs> Press, asked me um, if I would give him my manuscript. So, um, I don't know, I suppose I could be like a super famous author, but I haven't, I've been very happy uh, to publish with uh, local presses in Minnesota, um, and have been content about that. Um, so Jim Perlman is the publisher of Holy Cow Press. It's been around for 35 years. It's a fairly esteemed uh, press. It has national distribution, which was one of the reasons I chose to, to work with them. Um, and Jim Perlman and I hired an independent editor, uh, Jim Stilar, who worked with me on organizing the poem and poems and selecting the poems. Um, and one of the things I'd like to impress upon those of you that are writers is that you never get done Getting, learning how to revise and learning how to improve your writing. Um, and so I work with editors to learn how to do that. Um, and sometimes we don't have enough distance from our own writing to really see how we need to edit it. So I had not one but two editors uh, helping me with this book and it's a much, much better book um, because of them. And I think 90% of the flaws in here are because I didn't listen to them because I'm a bit pig-headed and stubborn sometimes. Um, I will be teaching a class on uh, called The Writer's Life on Publication next semester if you're interested more in publishing. There's some information in the back of the room as well as lots of flyers about all the other creative writing classes and you can pick those up after the presentation. 
Um, several people wanted to know about the cover. How did I pick the cover? I was actually very lucky to get to pick the cover. Most authors do not get to select their cover at all. Um, when I started working with Minnesota Historical Society Press, my very first conversation with them was, you do not get to choose the title, and you do not have to get to choose the cover. Um, and when my then six-year-old daughter said, Mommy, why is the word gun on the front of your book? I had to explain that to her, and that was a little uncomfortable. Um, so I came from that experience to this experience where I got an email uh, from my publisher that said, you need to pick your cover in a week and a half. And I said, what? Um, so I had no idea what to do. Um, so I emailed a good friend of mine, Hyde Erdrich, who works with artists. Uh, she's an arts curator as well as a writer and uh, poet. Um, and she gave me some links to several artists. Um, and I came across this image by Julia Buffalo Head, who's a young painter who lives in St. Paul, actually Paige across the street from Paige Real. Um, and uh, she uh, does a lot of paintings uh, with, with little animals and with children and with women. Um, and I liked this image so much for several reasons. Uh, the first one is the mask, the persona. Um, there's several poems in the book that are persona poems, and it's the poet speaking through that mask. So as you can see on the front of the book, um, the woman here laying is with the mask. I also liked the pregnant image. I thought in some ways it was sort of a feminist statement to have a pregnant woman on the front, but also she's sort of perhaps dreaming, imagining the world. She's got a world within her, um, and it also hints to the fact that there's poems about mothering um, and child childbearing um, in the book as well. Um, I also liked the nature, um, the little animals and the trees around here, um, and there's also some Native American connections in some of the historical poems in the book and through some of my own experiences. So I liked all of those things that echoed um, in the picture. So I luckily got to choose the picture for the book, so I was very happy about that. Um, let's see, one person asked, when did I start writing? Um, I failed at every other art form, which is how I ended up as a writer. Um, all of my report cards when I was in grade school said, Catherine is a bright but sensitive young lady. And that but meant, you know, the sensitive part was bad, right? Um, but I had all these feelings and um, I needed to express them and I tried uh, visual art and pottery. I did professional theater for many years. Um, and none of that was quite right. And all the whole time I had finally, I had been writing. Um, and so finally when I got to college, I decided uh, that I would start writing more seriously um, and went off on that path. Um, conversely, several, uh, also several people asked me if there was any teachers that influenced me. Absolutely, I would not be standing here today um, if it wasn't for Miss Youngquist, my fourth grade teacher, who, in, who just inspired all of us to be creative. Um, if I hadn't had some wonderful professors, um, amongst them quite great at Hamlin University when I did my undergraduate degree there. Um, and I've actually got a poem in here about Robert Dana, who was here for the Two Rivers Reading Series many, many years ago. Um, and that poem is on page 51. It's called Wichita Cockroaches. So I went to a graduate school in Wichita, and he was my professor my first semester in graduate school. Wichita Cockroaches. We were a ragtag random bunch, rejects brought together on the barren plains of southern Kansas, a flat town laid on a grid, watery beers in bars, 13 Titan missiles, a nuclear bracelet, gleaming and winking their underground secrets around the barren cowtown turned city. You assembled us, shaped us with cabernet, poetic interrogation, and academic confrontation. Yes, I sobbed on the balcony after my first critique. Yes, I did not know how to punctuate my poems. You split a case of Chablis with me, called me your kid, ordained me poet, and sent me on my way. Those were lost days, RP, before we wandered into other jobs, selling records, working the racetracks, writing obituaries or rhymes for honor <coughs> cards. Our scruffy group of survivors, as enduring as cockroaches, leaving in the cracks and crevices, tough and armored, inelegant and smooth, black and dirty, getting by, surviving, and sometimes writing a poem. So he has a poem about Wichita cockroaches, so that was why I wrote that poem in response. Yes? The poem Salvation? 
Okay. Um, All that. That's pretty good. You're in the group too. Okay. Um, why don't I read that poem, Salvation, and then we'll talk about it. Um, and that is on page 11. Thanks for bringing that up, and I hope some more of you are going to have questions in just a minute. So, Salvation, Thief River Falls, 1919. One of the questions somebody asked was, um, why is there the place and the date here? Uh, one of the reasons I often have the place and the date above some of the poems is the poem really does go around the world. There's poems that take place in China, there's poems that take place um, in Eastern Europe. Um, and so because the reader is kind of jolted from place to place and time to time, I sometimes cue the reader with that little phrase of time and place. So this is a historical poem then in a small town, 1919. Pastor was a towering man with slumped shoulders and a heavy brow. At the pulpit, you could, could not see his eyes, just his mouth moving, his loud voice echoing against the granite walls, the polished pews. After service, he always held Mama's hand, saying life was hard, 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 and laying a blessing atop <clears throat> my head, like patting a lamb. I squirmed, already uncomfortable, in tight lace-up boots and a too small frock, layers of petticoats, my older sister's worn wool coat buttoned tight. Some nights Mama sent a casserole to his small house. I walked carefully, the small covered glass dish between two towels. He would try to detain me with questions, try to detain me, ask me questions, but I would not talk, head down, knowing he might see my sins. The time I scribbled in Anna's book when I was a toddler, the stolen piece of pie from a church bazaar, the place my hand went at night under the cover to comfort myself when I was alone. I know he saw through my silence. My mother had warned me to be polite, but I could not leave until excused to run back home. I never told my mama how he, he, he held my thin arms tight in his grip, how he talked with hot wine breath, his face close to mine, how I shook with fear and almost peed when his hands touched the front of my dress and cupped the space between my legs. I heard my shame in his towering voice burning. I vowed I would only speak when spoken to, to be kind to my younger brother and older sister. I vowed to take no pleasure in the sweet summer peaches in the orchard, in the tall weaving grass on the prairie, the cool green water at the swimming hole. I vowed to cleanse myself, to immerse myself in the waters of holy sacrifice, to record in my diary every day my good deeds, to erase my sin, to control my hands, his hands, his ungodly hands. So several people asked if this was a real story and if this had happened to me, and absolutely not. This is something that I had imagined. Um, and usually I work pretty hard on poems, but this is one of the poems that just sort of came to me as a whole little story. The voice kind of came and spoke the story into my ear and I wrote it down. Um, and uh, this is kind of an examination of, of what this situation might have been like a long time ago. Luckily we've got programs like our Green Dot program here at Anoka Ramsey. Uh, to help people deal uh, with these kinds of difficult situations. Um, so this is not a true story. Yes? I was just wondering why, in your very face, why the young girl, like, she sounds like she takes the blame on herself. Yes, I think, I think in the poem, like she all, does blame herself. How her mother and that, you know, So um, his question is, uh, did the girl feel that she was blaming herself? Yes, yes, she did. And I think that happens a lot of times with sexual abuse. And so one of the functions, functions of this poem is to get that conversation going um, and to get people talking about that. And I really appreciate uh, your concern um, for the characters in the poem. Are there other requests, questions? Another um, poem that some people had wanted me to read was Bones, and I'm going to ask this. Oh, this question over here? I was just wondering how you chose like the layouts for the poems. Like on page 44 for a scene, I'm looking at the scene three and how it kind of skips 
pedals all the way down, like how did you choose that? Or even for the last poem, you just read what was all on the left side. Okay, so the structure, how did yeah, I- Yeah, how did you choose the structure? How did I stru choose the structure of the poems? Well, one of the things um, I worked with, uh, with my editors, was to create a variety of different sizes and shapes of poems. Um, I didn't want the book to be consistently all uh, one particular structure. Now, that said, there's absolutely fabulous books. Uh, Jim Moore, who teaches at Hamlin University, his most recent book had the exact same structure all through the book, and that created some continuity, some thread. Um, but I wanted to get a little bit of variety in here. Um, so some of the poems you might see um, are just more traditionally uh, spaced uh, with stanzas, um, but some are all over the page. Um, so for instance, uh, dark, early spring dark lake, um, the poem is literally all over the page. Um, actually, this was all over the page even more on the draft. I had to shrink it down for the publisher to fit it on the printed page. Um, but the structure of the poem is supposed to reflect the conflict, uh, I'm sorry, the content of the poem. So this poem is about ice breaking up on a lake, and so it's fragmented. Uh, the ice is kind of floating around the page uh, with the words. Uh, the poem I just read, Salvation, I kind of heard that poem as one long sentence, you know, as one long story. You know how little kids say, and this, 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 and they don't stop. So I kind of heard that girl's voice. And so I wanted that long, skinny shape that just propelled you down through the words, through the poem, uh, without really stopping. Um, so there's other poems that don't necessarily uh, reflect the content of this. this there's more stanzas that are more like paragraphs as you switch from idea to idea, and the poem cues the reader in that way. But I tried to get a variety in the book, um, just so you wouldn't get bored when you were reading it. Thank you for your question. Yes? I have said that poem is true. Mm -hmm. Uh, the question is, is the poem The Fruit meant to be humorous? No, not at all. Um, I wrote the trigger for that poem was a newspaper article um, in the Minneapolis Star and Tribune uh, about a Planned Parenthood program where they were trying to educate um, young girls about sex and the girls didn't necessarily know where babies came from and they found out that the mothers didn't know uh, where babies came from. And I thought, wow, what would it be like to live life not knowing how you got pregnant? Imagine, girls, you're sitting next to a guy, some of you. Um, so I took that idea and thought, man, what would that be like? Um, and again, created that persona poem. Yes? There is a sense of you and a baby wanting to know where you came from. Well, this would be how you got pregnant. Uh, this, was, this was not knowing how, how you got pregnant. So, um, so this is the trigger for that poem was that newspaper article. All right, some other people had asked about a poem called Bones. I'm going to have Kathy Y come up and read that with me. Um, and another one of the structures that's different um, is some of the poems have two voices. So we're on page 29. Um, and if you read the notes in the back of the book, uh, on page 59, you'll see that Bones contains excerpts taken from the Northwoods Shopper uh, on May 25th, 2009. And so Kathy's going to be the Northwoods Shopper, um, and I'm going to be the other voice in the poem. And this is Two Harbors, 2009, Bones. Will do. Clean homes, cabins, etc. Reliable, reasonable rates. Waking up at the roadside motel to see my view. The graveyard, small rounded stones and lines, flat insets punctuate the browning flat grass. <coughs> For sale, black sunflower seeds. In the foreground, lines, then a sketch of white summer sky, sizzling air, the relentlessly blue lake. Wanted, vendors to sell their craft items at Christmas in July. Just north along the highway, white amputees fall. Stressed from drought, insects, and snow. I wish home health care, providing quality care for people of any age. The delicate white birch give up their bones to pine, hardwood, purple-topped grass. High school boy will do mowing, raking, other yard work. 
have own equipment. What graveyard will my children wake to? These woods gone to prairie, animals with thin fur and quick eyes. <coughs> Clarinet lessons for any elementary aged child. Call Ariel. We plant things neatly using measurements, asphalt and lines, not a streak of blue, the a brilliance of green, the white barked tree breathing. For sale, oak firewood, some birch. Thank you. So that poem is about, um, as, as I said in the poem, waking up, uh, looking out in the graveyard in two harbors, but I've just been driving along the North Shore um, and was rather horrified by the number of uh, birch trees that were dying. Have any of you been up there this last summer? Um, they're getting very stressed from the drought, from the hotter temperatures, um, from the more violent storms. Um, there's, uh, they're being more eaten uh, by different diseases and different insects uh, because the trees are stressed. Um, and I love that northern landscape very, very much. My own uh, college professor, Clay Brigg, used to say that we're happiest when our external landscape matches our internal landscape. And for me, it's that those lakes and those trees um, and that water, the rocks up north that really attract me. Um, and so I'm, I'm very concerned uh, to see the landscape changing so much. Um, and I'm scared that that may not be there, that the trees may not be there, that the boundary waters may not be there uh, when my kids are my age. So that's kind of what that poem is doing. Um, and sort of, sort of fragmenting in um, the economic realities of our situation, as uh, outlined in the Northwoods Shopper, versus kind of this longer view of looking at the landscape. Any questions from the audience? I'm going to take some that you've written then, if nobody has any. Let's see, in the things I learned from my grandmother, were those all things your grandmother actually taught you, or were they just random lessons that popped in your head? Um, things I learned from my grandmother is a tribute to my grandmother, um, and you did hear me read my poem about my grandfather, and those are on opposing pages, so on page 15 is things I learned from my grandmother. And here's a different shape again, it sort of looks like a staircase, a backward staircase, um, and it's a list poem. Um, list poems, I think, are a really great way for people to start writing poems. You just can make a list of things. Um, and so this is a list, hopefully, of things that'll give you a picture of what my grandmother was like. Wear rubber gloves while washing dishes to keep your hands soft for hand holding. Carry a file, a plastic rain bonnet, and a small packet of tissues in your snap shut purse. <clears throat> Let the men pump the gas. When you aren't sure what to eat for lunch, open the refrigerator and see what falls out. Do not talk about childbirth, romance, or sex until you are too old to be embarrassed by it. Soft cheeks are good for kissing. It is legal to peruse the dictionary while playing Scrabble. Marry a man you can beat at Pinnacle. Men's work is outside the home, women's on the inside. Do not let people know you speak German. Cooking does not involve spices. Tend the flowers in your garden, peonies, roses, columbine. When picking raspberries with your small grandchildren, hang an old coffee can with a string attached around your neck to keep both hands free. Read Family Circus for the cute things kids say. Pay attention to what the men in Washington are doing with your social security. A woman's goodness is judged by the cleanliness of her house. Always say a visit was too short when you say goodbye. Do not question the doctor. Leave with grace. So yes, that's all true. So some of the poems then are from my perspective, my experience, and some of the poems that are things that I have imagined. There's a mixture of both of those. Um, another question, how long did it take you to write all of the poems from the book? Um, it took a long time. Um, I'm a community college teacher, I'm a mother, um, I've got a busy life, so usually it takes me quite a long time. I usually write in the summer um, and don't write a lot during the school year. What I do during the school year is jot down notes. I have a file that says poems on it and I scribble notes sometimes in the car, 
or late at night, I'll stick them in there. Um, and then in the summer, or sometimes I run away from home on writing retreats um, and go work on those poems. But I don't write a whole lot during the school year. You're supposed to write every single day, and that's ideal. And if you're taking a creative writing class, hopefully you've got time to do that. Um, but I write and work slowly. So my first game book came out in 2002, and then this book came out um, last year. So it was quite a while between the two books. I also did the anthology in between, and that took a couple of years as well. I underestimated the amount of work the anthology would be. I thought that would be like having a dinner party, invite a few people to submit essays, and then, hey, we you know go out and do a few readings and celebrate. And that was actually a couple of years of very hard editing. Um, and I think this book took a year and a half or two as well. Um, so this is a selection then of the work <coughs> that I wrote between the last book, uh, when the last book was published, and this book. Um, some of the poems were rejects from the first book, like Early Spring Dark Lake, the one that's all over the page. Um, wasn't ready when I published the first book, but it did become ready then as I worked on the second book. Um, and a lot of the poems didn't make it in here as well, so this is kind of the greatest hits from that particular time period. Um, some people I know try to write about a theme. Um, my, my friend Hyde Erdrich, I mentioned earlier, her recent book is called Cell Traffic, and it's about, um, she's, she's Ojibwe, part of Ojibwe, and it's about trafficking of bones and bodies and people and genetics and identity. And so that was kind of the theme that that book is around. Um, another recent uh, book that came out in the Twin Cities is Leslie Adrian Miller's book, Why, um, for the Y chromosome. And it's a, both about her experience as a mother raising a boy, as well as some scientific evidence about the difference between men and women. So some people kind of set out uh, to write about a particular theme. I'm a lot more haphazard. I kind of see what theme emerges. Um, and hopefully, as you heard me read some of these poems, you hear some threads about safety, um, about pretending things are safe. Uh, this is a post 9-11 book. Um, I uh, had to pretend when the Twin Towers were falling down that things were okay because my three-year-old son, his whole world would have been pulled apart if he didn't understand that planes did not usually fly into buildings and that buildings uh, did not usually fall down. So I had to turn off the TV um, and pretend everything was okay. So part of this is just becoming a parent and saying, oh, sure, there's a tornado out there, but we'll be fine. Let's just go to the basement and we'll play some games down there, uh, when really you're actually kind of worried. Um, and you can hear that thread of both from the poems about my grandfather and some of the poems from outside of my experience as well that we've heard about salvation, um, as well as poems. So there's that, that nice surface of things looking okay, but underneath it, things may not necessarily be safe. What are some questions that you all have? Anybody on this side of the room? This side of the room? Let's see. Okay, another okay. Poem, uh, question um, about the poem Cutting Bread from Kent Jordan um, is, in the poem Cutting Bread, is it just addressing how people may react to an atrocity in another part of the world, or does the knife in the cutting symbolize something else? Do I have five minutes? Yeah, about well, five minutes. Five okay. minutes. We'll read that poem and then we'll wrap up. So that poem is on, it's at the end of the first part. And the first part kind of starts out with some childhood poems, some memory poems. Uh, the second part moves into some of the persona poems in the world. And the third part then ends with some poems about the writer and the self. And if I can find Cutting Bread, I will read it for you. It's the last poem in the first section. It's on page 26. Cutting Bread. Making sandwiches in the late night house, she cuts heavy crusted bread with a long serrated knife. Crumbs of grain gather on the coarse wood board. Darkness bleak breathes in the summer windows. A BBC voice tells of atrocities in Iraq, heads cut from bodies held high for the camera, ski masked rebels clutching them by the hair. Above her, children and husbands sleep, windows open to the rhythm of cars passing, Echoes of train wheels on trestles, cicada in tall grass. 
the earth breathes, the bread breathes too. She slides sandwiches into plastic bags, presses zippers, sealing them in. She turns off the radio and stands in starlight. The knife on the counter by the sink, she walks the stairs to join the sleeping. So this poem was written at the beginning of the Iraq War. I was making a lot of sandwiches at my house. But notice I've used third person she here to distance myself. This, this persona in the poem isn't necessarily me. Uh, we don't have trains outside our windows, for instance. Uh, but what I was examining here um, was in some ways how we were all involved um, in this situation. We were all sort of guilty in some ways by association if we were sleepwalking. Um, and we need to be conscious of what was going on. I'm going to end um, on a sweet note, I hope. So let's look at first kiss. A couple people had wanted to know that. Was this true? And this is true. First Kiss, St. Paul, 1973, on page 18. Amid the ransacking rumble of semi-trailers, we stumbled the sloped hill of Pierce Butler, the truck route near the train tracks. Around small trees and large bushes, weeds sticking into our clothes, we half slid to a secluded spot. He knelt, pulled me down. Facing each other, a light press of lips, no more than a promise a signature on a blank page in light blue ink that fades in sunlight, a slight spray of small flowers amidst gray clouds. So thank you very much. <laughs>